Hey everybody, welcome to the Parlay with Destiny J, and I'm Destiny, and today I have another great show for you planned. And on this show, we talk about topics related to pop culture, social issues, and health and wellness. And I have with me another special guest today. We have Dr. Umar. So Dr. Umar, you want to say hey to the people? Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me on the show. So um, I know I have been following your work for a few years now, um, and it was mainly because uh, I, I came across one of your lectures on YouTube, and it was basically, I think the first lecture I saw you were giving advice on to people with children in the schooling system that have been diagnosed with ADHD, and then you were basically telling them why the school system does that. So that's kind of what got me interested in you and your story. So for those people that are out there that don't know who you are at all or don't know much about you, can you just give us a brief description of who you are and what you do? Certainly. I'm a doctor of clinical psychology, so I do clinical work as it relates to evaluating and treating mental disorders, uh, depression, anxiety disorder, bipolar uh, ADHD, all of those are mental disorders. My expertise is in school psychology, which I've been doing for the past almost 20 years now, where I evaluate in the school setting for learning problems, autism, emotional disturbance, intellectual disability, reading disabilities, math disabilities. I work with deaf kids, blind kids, traumatic brain injuries, developmental delays, orthopedic impairments, and such uh, things like that. So I do that more than anything else that is largely the profession um that i uh work work through nowadays and i do therapy uh, a lot of therapy with children a lot of therapy with families some therapy with couples so i kind of between both worlds a school psychologist as well as working as a clinician as well and um basically i'm on a mission to try to empower and educate black parents about their rights and about the dangers of making bad decisions regarding our children. I think a lot of what happens to black kids is the result of bad decisions by their parents. Remember, you can't put a kid in special ed unless you have the parent permission. You can't evaluate a child without parent permission. You can't prescribe the medicine without parent permission. So all of these problems that we see from the uh, dismally low high school dropout rates to the dismally high special ed rates, all of this is being done with parental approval. And so that's where, you know, I really try to make an inroad. I'm also author of the book, Psychoactive and Ecological, the Special Education and ADHD War Against Black Boys, which is a must read for anyone who either cares about black children or are raising black children because it's the only book in print written by a black school psychologist that teaches our parents how to navigate the dangerous and manipulative world of education and mental health for black children. Great. That, that is, 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 is refreshing to hear that we have somebody such as yourself advocating for, um, black parents and black people in general. Um, I really dwell on, on positive energy and, and people doing positive things for the people in my community. I am black. So this, this topic is near and dear for me. And I do have children that I'm raising as well. So, um, just from myself and I know the people that are listening, we just would like to thank you for everything that you do for us and, and our children. We need more American Africans to get their certifications in special education. We need more special ed uh, experts, more school psychologists, because 99% of all school psychologists in America are not black. That means 99% of our children who are being put in special ed are being placed there by people who are not culturally familiar with African-American children. That is very dangerous. And that helps explain the dismally high rate of black kids in special ed. But it can also be explained by the fact that 93% of America's teachers are middle-class white racist females 
you can care less about whether or not black kids learn. And that's the biggest reason for why the schools are failing. It's not because the pants are sagging. It's not because the daddy's in jail. It's not because mom is not married. It's not because it's the gangster rap. It's not because he's poor. He's struggling because a white teacher is responsible for his learning. And when white folks are not natural stakeholders in the success of black folk, they never have been, they never will be, which is why I have predicted that as long as our children are dependent upon white women to master their academics, they will always be behind. Mm, That's deep. That is extremely deep. So I'm going to segue um, actually into uh, your Breakfast Club interview, because I know that that was it was surprising to me to see you on there, honestly. Um, but I was happy. Which one? See. I was on there twice. The first or the second? I think it was the latest one. I don't think I saw the first one, but the latest one that okay. you, you did. First one I had on the suit, latest one I had on the dashiki. No, it was the one that it was definitely the first one then. Did not see the one with the dashiki. It was the first one. Okay. But um, okay. but I was surprised to see you there and I was surprised to see you there because I know that you speak openly about uh, systematic white supremacy and um, to that platform is huge for the quote unquote urban community. So um, after you did the first interview, how was the support? Did you did you see like a, a, a gain of, of support, an influx of support after that interview aired? Uh, significantly, I'll put it like this. Um, before the Breakfast Club interview, I was already one of the most requested black scholars in the world in terms of coming out to speak at colleges and universities and that type of thing. And I thought that I was at the top of my game, so to speak. But after that first Breakfast Club interview, I realized how many black people did not know me. Like it was so uh, 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 interesting to get that many phone calls and emails from people who had never heard my name. And people are like, I saw you in a breakfast club and I went to YouTube and I typed you in and I've been watching you all week and I just can't stop. And da, 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 when your school open, and it was humbling because it's like, wow, like you thought you were done. You're not done. Most of the people who saw your breakfast club interview never heard of Dr. Umar Johnson. And the second time, my goodness, my second Breakfast Club interview was one of their most reposted interviews ever. And I'm not a rapper, an actor, or an entertainer. I'm a school psychologist, but yet my Breakfast Club views are higher than many rappers and entertainers that they bring on there. And I think that's just a testament to the information itself, that our people are thirsty for the information, and they're very thirsty You know, for the truth. And the ironic thing about the Breakfast Club interview, the irony is every time I walked in there, it appeared as if it was going to be a regular, casual interview. Like, there seemed to be nothing uh, dynamic about it. You know, just a good conversation with some good people both times. And it's amazing because when that first one got posted and the way that thing just went crazy, I said, well, I did not expect that. And then the second one, I definitely did not. The second one, was received more than the first. And the first was tremendous. But this second Breakfast Club interview, I mean, everywhere I went, every airport, weren't you on the, I mean, weren't you on the Breakfast Club? That's the guy from the Breakfast Club. And it's just like, wow. And I know they can't bring me on there all the time because of who I am and what what I represent. But I'm very very thankful to uh, DJ Envy Charlemagne and Angela Yee for bringing me just once a year. I've only been there twice. You know, but as far as I'm concerned, with the type of response I get on the Breakfast Club, I really only need to come once. I mean, my Breakfast Club interviews were more viewed than any other political interview they had, including Minister Farrakhan. So, um, you know, and I have tremendous respect for Minister Farrakhan. So it just, it's, it, and then because of my age, because I'm 40, I'm young, I'm a product of the hip hop generation, you know, I'm at that place where I can go between both worlds. You know, I can deal with the youth on the corner. I can deal with the pants sagging. I can deal with the prisoners. You know, I do a lot of work in prisoners. I get a lot of support mail from inmates, as a matter of fact. You know, so I can deal with the young, and then I can go right across the street and deal with the middle class, educated, black, who's one of the, and try to get them to understand that you need to do more than your community. And just because you made it doesn't mean it's an opportunity for all black folks. So I've been blessed with that diversity. You know, I still keep, and I still have 
my new Philly ghetto hood roots, you know, and I think because I've never given up my uh, community credibility, I'm able to reach a lot of very different diverse groups within the black community. That's that's amazing because the, the Breakfast Club is a big deal. And it grew into this monster over the years. And I I was very, very surprised to see you on there because you 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 speak openly about how you feel about white supremacy. So, you know, you would think that platforms yeah. like that would be, you know, kind of leery because they're not sure what you might say, you know, but I'm glad that. you. Well, I that. also think that they were pushed. I also think that there was some nudging from the community. I think there was some nudging. I noticed. On, and not necessarily with the Breakfast Club, but really speaking with different radio platforms, a lot of times the community demand me. For example, I'm the most requested scholar on a university level in America. No scholar gets more invitations to speak at university level than I do. And I've never been on major network television. But that's because of the students. In other words, the university might bring Cornell West. But the students are going to tell the university, we want Dr. Umar Johnson. And, 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 and normally when I get a phone call from administration at the university, be a white college or a black college, they all say the same thing. I really didn't know who you were. The students came in here and said, could we really look into bringing Dr. Umar Johnson here for Black History Month? You know, and that's about half of the time. It's the students, even with Breakfast Club and all these other networks, I really do think that it's the, it's the community that's like, hey, if y'all claim to be real, if you brought Minister Farrakhan up here, if you had Dick Gregory up here, Dr. Umar got the streets right now. When y'all going to get him? So I think to some extent, they almost have to bring me because the people are like looking like, wait, if you claim to really be about it, you cannot exclude him because he's the one that we watching right now. Right. You know, so I have to give a lot of credit, a lot of credit to the 17 to 27 year old generation. They are the ones that force the issue. I, you know, I'm disappointed that I've never been invited to the Oprah Winfrey show. I am because I look at what Oprah did for Dr. Phil. She made that man a multimillionaire. He's a regular TV personality because Oprah Winfrey gave him her platform. And here you have me. Oprah has never given me that platform. Don't get me wrong. I understand to an extent why, you know, because she's mainstream bourgeois and I'm grassroots revolutionary. But at the same time, as you saw with the Breakfast Club interview, I know how to taper my speech. I know how to tell them my message. I understand media. Right. Okay, and I understand that if my message in that interview is too strong, it'll never see the light of day. I could have went 20 times harder in that Breakfast Club interview, but I knew walking in that if you go hard, that interview will never be played. So I have to be real and I have to stay honest, but I have to present it in a much different way than what I would do if I'm at the local community center around the corner. That is, but it's amazing that you're able to do it because most people get lost. Most people go hard and then lose opportunities and, and things like that because they didn't think it through. They were just so gung ho about, you know, delivering their message and making sure that the people receive it the way that they want them to receive it. And they don't think about it like the way you do. I've seen it happen. Some of them aren't popular videos, you know, but thanks to the Internet, you're able to see those those type of things. But um, it was just the Breakfast Club is huge. But with that being said, though, I'm, I want to talk about the Jay-Z's and the Kanye's and the Drake's. These people and. Pe some people are going to disagree with that, but I think that these people were actually created for what they do. The, the, the Jay-Z's were created. The Drake's were created by other cultures slash white supremacy to try to control and to, to organize us as black people in whatever way that they're, they want us to be organized in. So how important do you think, or do you think that it's even possible for black people to have the same effect in creating the artists that we want to listen to on the radio? I would agree with you. In fact, if you look at the history of black people in America, has not our whole our entire history here been about white people's ability to market us to other white people? Was not slavery about marketing black people to white people? Absolutely. Your college education. 
is about marketing you to white people. And on the uh, entertainment and athletic level, it's even more critical that you be marketable. I've heard it from so many different people in the music industry and, you know, because of where I'm at, where I am in my career, I come across a lot of uh, popular entertainers on a regular basis who follow my work. They might send me a text message, keep it up, we watching you, yada, yada. Okay. And everyone knows that in order for you to become successful, you do not have to be a talent. You do not have to be a talent. You have to be marketable and you have to be manageable. That's it. If you are marketable and manageable, you can be extremely successful and extremely rich in the United States, whether it's Oprah Winfrey, Bill Cosby, LeBron James, or Jay-Z and Beyonce. All of them are marketable and all of them are manageable. They don't say anything that contradicts the American social order. They don't do anything that would create any type of insurrection within the status quo. If you are manageable and marketable, it's not about talent. I agree with you. You know, now, when you say that they were created, I think that's an appropriate word. But for people who find it to be too strong, I would say that they were selected. You know, Drake isn't the greatest talent out of Canada. He's a very talented brother, don't get me wrong, but he's not the greatest thing they could have found in Canada. But given his Jewish heritage, they knew that he could be marketable and manageable. Jay-Z is not the greatest rapper. We know that. Okay? But Jay-Z is marketable and manageable. Beyonce ain't got the best voice. Okay? She's a tremendous entertainer and singer. I take nothing away from none of them. My point is, they were not the best at it. But they were chosen because they were marketable and manageable. If you can be meek, and if you can learn how to speak, if you can be meek and learn how to speak, so what to say and when to say it, you can go very far in the American social order. Hmm. And I guess that's what separates them from others. But people, some people, oh, without question, people, some people don't, don't believe that they were, you know, for, for, they don't believe that they were selected. They don't believe they think that their talent is what got them everywhere. But if you look at the history of Beyonce, she was groomed to be who she is today from a child. They, yes. they groomed her and people look at that and be like, oh, her work ethic is great and she's been doing this for a long time. Not realizing that she was sacrificed. She sacrificed a lot of being a regular person to be who she is today. She did not have a normal childhood or what we would consider normal because they selected her and she was being placed in her mold to be who she is today. A lot of, some people don't believe that. And I think that it's important to know because a lot of us get lost in the sauce. We do. And then without question, and then we don't without know, question. we don't know where, wh where it went wrong. We don't know what happened. And then we looking like Kanye West looking crazy. Yeah. Yeah. See, America is not healthy for black people. It's not healthy for black people to be rich or poor. It's not healthy for black people, whether you're working class or middle class. It's not rich if you have no, it's, it's not healthy for you if you have no class. And see, what black people are trying to do, and you see this, we've been doing it since slavery. We've been doing it since the Dr. King era. We're trying to convince ourselves that we can be successful in America on an individual basis. And the reason we're trying to convince ourselves that we can be successful in America on an individual basis is because we have too much contemptuousness, too much disregard for one another. Black people hate nothing more than they hate each other. In fact, I often say that we will not change anything for American Africans. We will not change nothing until we learn to hate racism more than we hate each other. Because as long as we hate each other more than we hate racism, nothing will change. Look at black culture, whether it's hip hop, athletics, TV culture, or in the neighborhood. Our entire culture, if you've noticed, our popular culture is based on conflict. If a rapper is not beefing with another rapper, he will not be going platinum. Okay? If, 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 if a reality show doesn't involve a lot of disrespectful 
downgrading content, con- conflict-based content that will not be a popular show. Why is Empire so popular? Because there's nothing but conflict within the central characters, the black family there, the Hakeem, Jamal, the Andre, the Lucius, the Cookie. They are always what? They're not fighting other people. Most of the time. They're fighting who? Each other. Tyler Perry's movies. Why are they so successful? Conflict amongst black folks. Why did I get married? Four dysfunctional couples. The one woman went and got a tube side, didn't tell her husband. But he got got in a rear, gave it to his girlfriend, didn't tell him. This one leaves his girlfriend out in the middle of the snow. I mean, we love to see black people being attacked by other black people. And this has its roots in slavery. In slavery, slave masters would make us fight each other. And if you won, you would get something for that. It wasn't much, but you would get something for that. And then they added merit, 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 meritorious manumission laws. If you help us keep slavery in, in, in order, we will reward you by giving you your freedom. Never mind the fact that what we're doing to your people is wrong. Worry about yourself. We have to understand that individualistic culture of the African-American is not indigenous to the African continent. African people are collectivists by nature. We became individualistic through slavery. People don't don't understand that post-traumatic slavery disorder is a, a real a real thing. It is real. It's real. It is real. I talk about it. That is. I wish white folks would diagnose it. I wish they would add it to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, but they're not going to add it because if they acknowledge post-traumatic slavery disease as a real disorder, that would open them up for significantly more reparations lawsuits. Black people would be able to claim that our mental health is a direct result of slavery. Clearly, clearly, some statutory damages will be owed to such a situation. That's why they do not like to admit that we still suffer from slavery because if you are disadvantaged as a nation today because of things that were done to you yesterday, then that clearly meets the UN definition of genocide. When you look at the U.N. definition of genocide, black people clearly meet that. But we have not sought reparations and we have not filed grievance against America for genocide because most of us are not interested in being identified as anything other than good old fashioned Americans. We love white folks more than we love God. We love white folks more than we love our children. We love white folks more than we love ourselves. Black people do not want to admit it. But I'm telling you that we are in love with white people, white culture, white civilization more today than we were in love with it during slavery. That's sad. It is so sad. I I just have one more question. And this is a question that I've I've been kind of thinking about um, as I go through my own personal journey. And I know that you travel all the time and I know that you have two little girls and with you traveling all the time to help other people's children, does it take a toll on your relationship with them? And do they understand? No, not that. I got you. Oh, well, my oldest is 14. She understands. My baby girl is five. I don't think she yet understands. I think she's just now beginning to realize who her daddy is. You know, I, I, my, my oldest daughter is interesting because she would send me text messages and she would say, you know, I'm in social studies class and we're watching you on TV and I'm telling everybody this is my dad and they don't believe me, you know? So she kind of had to grow into it because you know, this degree of, of quote unquote, and I hate to say the word, I hate to say it, but this degree of celebrity, if you would, you know, wasn't there when she was my baby girl's age. So she had to grow into that. Um, you know, but I make it a point to get home because I'm an old fashioned homebody type of a guy, you know, so I make it a point to get home a couple of days, um, every week. You know, most of my travel is that Thursday through Sunday. I think two years ago, I think I spoke 26 of the 28 days 
of Black History Month. So February, I'm going because everybody becomes black in February. Mm-hmm. That's the one <laughs> month that black people. It's 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 so it's so it's so heartbreaking though that out of twelve months we're only interested in being ourselves during the shortest of those twelve months. But I'm going all that time. But during the week is uh, when I get an opportunity to spend time with my family. Well, I'm just trying to trying to find my balance, but hopefully it'll it'll come to me. Um, But um, I do. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me and to kind of uh, just talk some real stuff to my listeners, um, because there there are people that are interested in what you're doing, such as myself. I know I'm not the only one. There's plenty of people. So I'm just glad that you took the time to speak with me. But um, I'm just so grateful. I'm so grateful that you took the time today. So that's all I have for you. So I wish you much continued okay. success in your future endeavors. And hopefully we'll get to talk again soon. Definitely we will. Definitely we will. You have my number, so definitely uh, keep it touching. Yeah. Well, you have a good evening, and thank you again. Thanks again, love. Be safe down there. You too. Bye-bye. Take care now. Bye-bye. That was so fucking awesome! Parlay, parlay with destiny. Parlay. With destiny. Parlay.